Hello, everyone. If you've been scrolling through social media, watching a Netflix documentary, or listening to numerous podcasts lately, you might be a little confused about what you should actually be eating. Some experts and influencers recommend a vegetarian, pescatarian, insect-based, or vegan diet with meat but without oils, sugar, acids, dairy, and fun. Pretty confusing, right? Let's put aside all the fads and hype and answer a simple but fundamental question that we think isn't asked often enough. What should people actually eat? Without any agenda, we want to explore our original roots and trace them into the modern age. We look at what the body reacts to well and badly. At the end of this surprising journey, we will have an answer, but you might not like it. Let's start at the beginning, way back at the beginning. The earliest hominids appeared about 7 million years ago. We don't know much about these ancestors, but fossils of Sahelanthropus chidensis, the earliest hominids, show small teeth with a thick layer of enamel, suggesting they occasionally ate hard foods, such as nuts and seeds. However, their diet primarily consisted of softer foods, such as fruits, leaves, and insects, and sometimes some meat. If they did eat meat, it was probably mice, birds, fish, and small reptiles. There was a reduction in average height and an increase in signs of malnutrition and diseases related to nutrient deficiencies. But something else quite interesting happened during this time. Our genes changed. Seriously, most human cultures, but not all, develop lactase persistence relatively quickly on the timescale of evolution a fascinating genetic adaptation that allowed some populations to continue digesting lactose into adulthood, something we couldn't do so easily before. This trait is a direct and fairly rapid consequence of the domestication of dairy animals. It is an excellent example of how the development of agriculture in just 10,000 years has left a permanent mark on our DNA. This shows that human genetics are flexible who knows what new eating habits we will adapt to in the next thousands of years. While agriculture made us unhealthier than ever, you might think that trend eventually reversed. Finally, with the rise of the middle class in the 18th century, more people than ever before ate a varied agricultural diet. Gone were the days of eating bread and grits for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Instead, there were various types of meat, homegrown fruits and vegetables, as well as complex carbohydrates, nuts, seeds, and legumes. And thanks to long-life foods, nutrition was also better in winter. And yes, all of that helped. We recovered from and even exceeded hunter-gatherer nutritional standards. In developed countries, life expectancies broke through unprecedented limits. The problem was that this only happened in regions with a middle class, that had access to such a varied, nutritious diet. And of course, the Great Plague was on the horizon. Not the Black Death, but something much worse. A plague that once it took hold of society, ate us from the inside out. The plague of processed foods. I'm not gonna rant about the horrors of processed food because we've probably all heard more than our share of lectures about it. But one thing is certain, with the spread of processed foods in the world, obesity has exploded. Several meta-analyses over the past few decades have found a strong link between so-called ultra-processed foods and an increased risk of heart disease, stroke, and premature death. We have now discovered what we have eaten over the last 7 million years and how the human diet has changed during that time. But we haven't answered the most important question yet. What should people actually eat? To answer this, I approach it on two levels, human physiology and nutritional needs. Let's start with physiology. Let's consider the digestive tract. The length and complexity of an animal's gastrointestinal tract is directly related to its diet. Herbivores like cows have long, complex digestive systems with multiple digestive functions. Plant materials such as grasses and leaves can only be used difficult to break down, and cellulose, which is found in plants, requires longer fermentation to absorb nutrients efficiently. Some herbivores even have to eat their food again or eat their own feces because one pass through the digestive tract is not enough. Herbivores also need to eat throughout the day to get enough nutrients. Humans, on the other hand, can eat once, twice, or three times a day, or even once every few days, and still get enough nutrients. This suggests that the shorter colon of Homo sapiens is designed to consume more meat compared to herbivores. 
although it's not as short as pure carnivores, which makes sense since we're somewhere in between. We're omnivores. Humans also have very high stomach acid compared to other omnivores, and even higher than some carnivores. This is an evolutionary consequence of meat consumption, as strong stomach acid is required to kill bacteria that can multiply on meat. The human pancreas also produces special enzymes that are particularly good at breaking down proteins and fats. When you put it all together, Homo sapiens is one of the most adapted to meat consumption of all omnivores. But when glycogen stores are already full and more carbohydrates are consumed, they are instead converted into fat and stored in the body as fatty tissue. Excessive carbohydrate intake, especially simple carbohydrates like sugar, causes blood sugar levels to spike. This leads to the release of insulin to remove excess glucose from the blood. If this behavior is repeated over a long period of time, one can develop insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So carbohydrates are necessary as a source of energy, but too many, especially unhealthy carbohydrates, lead to diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and ultimately death. Then there are proteins, the prodigy of macronutrients. Proteins are the building blocks of life and are needed for muscles, bones, skin, hair, etc. to regenerate. The government recommends about 55 grams of protein per day, but new studies suggest athletes, weightlifters, and the elderly need more up to 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Not all proteins are equally valuable. Protein quality is more important than quantity. For efficient protein synthesis, the body needs complete proteins with all essential amino acids. Animal proteins such as meat, eggs, and whey protein are of the highest quality. Fats are also important for the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins and for brain health. There are saturated, unsaturated, and trans fats. Saturated fats are important, but must be balanced with unsaturated fats. Mono and polyunsaturated fats from olive oil, avocados, nuts, and fish are ideal. Omega-3 fatty acids are particularly important for brain function. Trans fats from industrially hydrogenated oils should be avoided if possible. 20 to 35% of calories should come from predominantly unsaturated fats. The body needs carbohydrates, fats, and especially proteins as macronutrients but there are also micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that are also essential. Fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, K can be stored, whereas water-soluble vitamins such as the B group and C must be consumed regularly. All vitamins play important roles, which is why a balanced diet with lots of nutrient-dense foods is ideal to meet your needs. Vitamin B12 is particularly interesting because it is the only vitamin that is practically only found in animal foods. It is produced by bacteria in the digestive tract of animals. For a vegan diet, B12 must be supplemented as it is essential for brain development, red blood cell formation, and heart health. The fact that B12 is only found in animal products suggests from an evolutionary perspective that humans are designed to consume meat and other animal products. However, there is no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to optimal nutrition. Every body reacts slightly differently to the same foods, depending on genetic factors and the individual microbiome. The new research field of nutrigenomics examines how certain gene variants influence the reaction to food in order to be able to provide tailored nutritional recommendations. However, if we want to identify the time when human nutrition was most optimal, most researchers agree that it was the hunter-gatherer period. In the Paleolithic era, as a hunter and foragers, the human diet was best adapted to evolutionary development. The diet consisted mainly of lean meat, fish, nuts, seeds, fruits, and vegetables. That's why many people today recommend the paleo diet, which includes exactly these foods and avoids processed foods. However, instead of the restrictive paleo diet, we recommend the Mediterranean diet as the optimal solution. This combines the advantages of the evolutionarily adapted paleo diet with the achievements of agriculture. Unlike the paleo diet, it allows whole grains, legumes, and dairy products like cheese and yogurt. As a result, the Mediterranean diet offers a greater variety of nutrients with more moderate restrictions. A central aspect is the focus on high-quality, unsaturated fats such as olive oil and fatty fish. These support the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. Olive oil is rich in monounsaturated fatty acids. 
Fish is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, both improve cholesterol levels and reduce inflammation. Overall, the Mediterranean diet is balanced, allows most unprocessed foods, and tastes delicious. Only highly processed products should be avoided. There is no one-size-fits-all solution for optimal nutrition. What is crucial is a variety of unprocessed foods with fruit, vegetables, high-quality fats and proteins, tailored to individual needs. Basically, we should eat as much as possible, as humans have done as hunters and gatherers for thousands of years. A return to a natural, preferably unprocessed diet with seasonal and regional foods seems to be the key to better health and well-being. Ultimately, however, we have to find out for ourselves what suits our body best. Only if we learn to pay attention to our body's signals again can we find the optimal diet for us. Maybe the hardest thing is to really listen to our bodies again. But that would be an exciting topic for another episode. At this point, we end today's episode. Thank you for your attention. As always, we wish you a long, healthy, and happy life. See you next time.